China promotes innovation and trade by investing in high-tech industries, supporting research, and expanding global partnerships. Here to explain how that government initiative works is my next guest, Robert Kuhn. He's written several books on the subject. I met Robert Kuhn at his home in New York. Let me ask about uh, the economic success. A lot of people feel that it uh, stems from efficiency, execution, and the speed of the government. What do you think are some of the contributing factors? Because we've watched this astonishing uh, just transformation of China. I mean, I remember interviewing Tom Brokaw, and he said the first time he went to China, he was like, you know, this place, everybody's on bikes, and it just and to watch what we've witnessed um, is just truly amazing. Uh, what do you what do you attribute it to? First of all. Uh, y y there are substantial advantages when you have when you don't have elections and you y you then don't have the the public pressure to deal with problems that you might have for an, an, a number of years if at the end you have a better result. So you're able to make decisions which in the short term may not be beneficial because you're investing in the future, but long term will. So there are definite benefits uh, for that, but we, we really understand how it works. And how it really worked was that the government was smart enough to allow the Chinese people at the lowest grassroots level to, to have some flexibility and freedom. And if you look at the early days of, of reform and the policies and the discussions between the leaders, I mean, I'm talking about you know in the late 1970s and 80s, uh, when after reform began, 1978, Mao Zedong died in, in, in 1976, and in 1978, Deng Xiaoping famously began uh, reform and opening up in a formal way. But there was a great deal. So China um, has had, the leadership has had the wisdom in these last four decades or so uh, to, uh, to recognize the innovations that are occurring and to deal with them within the context of the whole system. And it's very complex. And to really understand China, you also have to do another thing. And because people simplistically think, well, it's a one-party system, and therefore they're in control, so they don't have to worry about zoning laws, right? Uh, you can just, if you need to build a highway, you just build it and move the people, put them someplace else, take care of them best you can. But you don't, you, you don't have to have any public hearing. You just do it. And so it becomes easy to do things. There is, there is a, a, a degree of truth in that, of course. But if you say that that's the reason for China's success, that there's, that's the so-called China model, you then have to look at other countries that have a one-party system. And you would be hard-pressed to find another country that was as successful as China. So the, China's success, to really analyze it honestly, uh, is a great lesson, not just for uh, developing countries, which, has, which, which would have to take the lessons from China and restructure it and apply it to their own situation, because if they try to do it directly, they will fail, because no country is exactly the same. Uh, but it's also important for China itself to really understand the nature of its system and, uh, and the success of it and, and why it occurs. Kuhn is an American intellectual, investment banker, and media producer best known as the creator and host of the PBS series Closer to Truth, which explores science, consciousness, and philosophy. So looking back at the last uh, 20 years, um, China had significant challenges. Talk to me about the challenges it faced as it tried to evolve and, and lift so many people out of poverty. And then the challenges that occurred as a result, and how did China respond? Yeah. So it, it was very clear that economic growth had to drive the entire system, uh, and that was the um, and that was the directive for uh, you know two decades or more. Um, when we got to the the early aughts at the turn of the century, um, it, the economic growth was continuing. China entered the WTO in 2001, very significant 
fact, they were very debated in China at the time because they thought they might be very by harmed by that. Turned out to be the best thing for China that has ever occurred because they, they then had a dramatic growth spurt in terms of exports, et cetera. It works is because the organization department of the Communist Party, which is responsible for the promotion or demotion or, or jobs of, of the personnel in government and bis in, in state or enterprises, they are judging a person by a, by a set of criteria. At that point, the only criteria was economic growth. So the, 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 the leaders did anything possible for economic growth. And that's all that they were being measured on. And, it, it, you know, with 30-odd uh, 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 provinces um, and, and administrative zones and, ci you know, cities reporting to central government, you know, uh, 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 the, the, everybody has a growth rate and there's an average growth rate. And if you're below average in your area, your career is not going to be going so well. If you're above average, you will. So you'll do everything possible to drive that uh, 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 that growth rate. President Xi, you know, for uh, in the early years, you know, focused on what I call the three antis, uh, anti-pollution, anti-poverty, and anti-corruption. Uh, those were three driving policies that had to be done, and n none of them are economic growth. M uh, they are very particular um, uh, targets that are needed to create what was uh, for the early part of his leadership, the, the first target, which is the moderately prosperous society, which was targeted at the year 2020 um, to achieve a, a, a level which, which had, prior to President Xi, a quantitative um, uh, uh, target which was to double the GDP per capita of 2010 by 2020, which is purely an economic. President Xi changed that and added some other features to it, particularly the anti-poverty campaign where he said that we can't claim to be a moderately prosperous society even if we achieve the overall GDP per capita uh, by 2020 if we have any Chinese citizens who remain below the line of absolute poverty. So that was one of the drivers of the anti-poverty campaign for about eight or nine years uh, until that was part of the achievement of the moderately prosperous society by 2020. Since 1989, Kuhn has advised the Chinese government on economic policy, while also serving as a columnist for China Daily. You know, I was just at an event out in Southern California, and, and uh, a woman on the stage talked about the differences uh, here in the United States and China. And, and she lived there for about 30 years. And she said, uh, in China, there's just kind of a different way of thinking. It's the collective. Here in the United States, it's the individual. I have this right. Um, and there's a big difference. Can, can, can you describe that, or do you think that's accurate? The West uh, uh, um, uh, prioritizing uh, individualism in China, privileging collectivism, is an archaic and artificial way of thinking. And you really need to look at the details. And the, the, the Chinese evolution is fascinating because you do have the tradition of the collective, for sure. Uh, and though you have this new social media uh, strength of individuals. And to me, that, that actually creates a richness that is uh, necessary for empowerment in the future because the, uh, going back to the, to the principle objective of Chinese leaders is to make Chinese people's lives a uh, happier well-being, and that's more than economic growth. Well, the empowerment of individuals is an important part of an individual's well-being. And President Xi has uh, articulated that. He's talked about democracy and fairness in, in, in law and uh, being able to have diversity in cultural expressions and all different things. So it is it is a truism that China will privilege the collective in, in certain circumstances, but to exaggerate an artificial distinction between individualism and collectivism misunderstands what's going on in China, because there's a lot of individualism going on in China. And to achieve what President Xi wants to achieve in terms of the, the richness of Chinese civilization, you have to give people their individual capabilities to do lots of things. 
China has created a detailed system to manage artificial intelligence, including national principles that promote fairness, transparency, and safety, as well as strict rules for generative AI and algorithms. Innovation is a big part of China's long-term uh, growth strategy, um, but there are bottlenecks, as you know, technology, talent, uh, financing, IP. What are the most obvious obstacles and, and the most difficult obstacles to overcome? So to begin to talk about the importance of innovation, you have to understand it in this very broad picture because then innovation becomes the mechanism by which the total picture is, is, uh, is painted. And so when you look at innovation, uh, how do you do that? The first step in innovation is recognize that it, it cannot be legislated from on top. It has to be, you have to support what the bubbling cauldron of, uh, of innovation is at the, at the lowest levels. And so it's a very different way of thinking than China has had in the past. I have followed it carefully in the science industries. In science industries, I mean, not just the um, industries in terms of uh, industrial, but in, in the whole process of science, universities, research institutes in the science world. So there, there is uh, reform, and, and that means change, within the scientific community, giving, giving um, more of a peer review of scientific projects in a in a double blind sense, looking at projects, that, and it's not who is sponsoring the project, but what is the project and, and doing peer review. So there are, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a significant number of Chinese scientists, uh, many of whom were trained in the West who went back to China, uh, who are bringing uh, a new way of uh, allocating funds and uh, to competence as opposed to seniority. China has introduced a new K-Visa designed to attract young foreign science and technology professionals by allowing STEM graduates to enter, reside, and work without needing an employer sponsor. Let me ask you about AI because you brought this up earlier. I want to kind of circle back to it. It's how is China addressing AI um, and, and all of the ramifications about it. We know the ethics and the questions. And, and you've talked about transparency. And, and how is China being transparent about what it's doing with AI compared to other countries? China has uh, been uh, taking a leadership role in terms of how, how AI is used in its own country and, and therefore and recognizing that this is a, this is a world issue. So this is a, it's an important area for, for the future. Uh, that, that China recognizes uh, and how to go about it is, is very interesting because there's now high competition in China to develop AI models and how they work and how they're controlled and how they are uh, uh, integrated with the Chinese political system and sensitivities um, and yet uh, providing the, uh, the, uh, the, the capabilities to, uh, uh, to advance. Uh, one thing China is doing I think more uh, targeted than uh, the U.S. is doing, for example, is using AI in very specific uh, industry situations where they're developing industry-specific AIs, which will enhance individual industries. The U.S. is uh, r right now, at least, you know, has four or five major AI players. Uh, in the world, two or three very big ones, two or three medium-sized ones. I'm sure there are a lot of others that are generic, that can, can do everything. And they're getting really good uh, at, at many things. Uh, China has taken, they have some of that as well with DeepSeek, uh, which, is, which was uh, an exciting disruption and doing things much more efficiently. Uh, Alibaba, um, Baidu, uh, um, you know, Tencent, all of them are developing AI models. Um, and those are the, trying to be equivalent to the U.S., but China is taking a more active role in developing very specific AIs for different industries and how they can be efficiently used within industries. 
And I think that's a, a pioneering role. You mentioned it's a world issue. Um, you don't live very far from the United Nations. Should, you know, let's talk about international governance because it's not just China and U.S. Um, should there be international governance? What what like that look like? Uh, do you think that's something China would support? Uh, Ch China is very much uh, supportive of multinational uh, governance um, that is uh, uh, based on a Chinese principle of equality among nations. Uh, but non-interference with within nations. So that's been a a, 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 gen a general policy that China has been very consistent on, that all countries should participate equally in the world in terms of a world governance, um, and that the the world governance system should be based on current realities, not realities that are post World War II realities, where you know the five. Uh, Nations of the of the Security Council, uh, you know, had uh, uh, you know were two or three European countries, which now are not as important as other countries in the world. And the IMF uh, has been dominated by by Western countries. And that the the world realities in terms of the GDP in the world is is shifting. And the emergence of the the particularly uh, China number one, but also. India, Brazil, other countries, Indonesia are coming up in the world. So the world is becoming more uh, multipolar uh, than than uh, unipolar, and this is this is part of uh, this is a, this is a fundamental part of China's um, vision and foreign policy. So China is very much oriented towards multinational organizations, United Nations, and the various other organizations, BRICS, um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, other other uh, ones of the same nature. Um, and AI naturally fits into this uh, in terms of, uh, of governance because any of these um, uh, situations like AI, similar in some sense to nuclear weapons or chemical weapons, where there has to be some sort of an international consensus uh, in order to um, in order to uh, keep a uh, to keep bad actors or deleterious situations from developing, Dr. Kuhn, what a pleasure! Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. It's always great to see you, and uh, it's great working together.